Jordan. Uh, I'm George Megalogenis from the Australian newspaper, and we've got uh, Paul Keating, former Prime Minister, and we've got David Bessel, the uh, economic editor of the Wall Street Journal, hopefully to unpack what it is that's going on in the world at the moment and maybe solve some of the world's problems in the hour that we've got. Uh, I'll do the unpacking. Mr Keating will do the solving. <laughs> And uh, we'll allow some uh, 10 or so minutes at the end for questions, but uh, essentially it's a conversation between, um, between the Australian model and the US uh, model, which is in the moment, I think, in the process of still being uh, broken down before it gets rebuilt. Just give you qu some quick introductions. Uh, Paul Keating, as I was going through the CV, you've got to keep them short when you've got a long public life, but elected to Parliament in 1969 at the ripe old age of 25, was Minister in the Whitlam Government for about a month, I tried to uh, uh, about a month, which was uh, not a bad not a bad stretch for, by the standards of some of the ministers in that government. Treasurer in the Hawke government between 1983 and 1991, and Prime Minister, of course, from 91 to 96. And when we talk about the Australian model or the open economy that we that we have been enjoying the last few years, there's a couple of world recessions we've dodged. Um, you're looking at the architect, I think, of most of the principal changes, and he's also the author of a book. He's also an author of the book Engagement, but uh, no doubt every publisher in Australia has been uh, pestering him to write his memoirs because uh, that's a bit of unfinished business, I think, in public life, if I could just drop that in. But David, <laughs> <laughs> not speaking on anyone's behalf. Now David's the economics editor of the uh, Wall Street Journal and has just put together a terrific book in Fed We Trust, Ben Bernanke's War on the Great Panic. So essentially we're talking to his book and it's published in Australia by a scribe. Now, he writes the capital column in the Wall Street Journal, which is a weekly look at the forces shaping living standards around the world. He's got two shared Pulitzer Prizes to his name, one for the Boston Globe in 1983 on the persistence of racism in Boston, and another for the Wall Street Journal in 2002 on corporate wrongdoing. Uh, now, he's got, like most of the journalists nowadays, regular presence in all arms of the media, radio and television as well. Now, I want to have a... Sorry, we'll let David have a <laughs> welcome. And we want to have a, a, a decent debate about the world as it, uh, as it stands at the moment, but we're not going to assume any prior knowledge, so maybe to throw to each, maybe David actually might, might start explaining what happened uh, in the last couple of years, why this uh, great panic turned out to be a great recession. Well, uh, thank you. It's, it's very good to be here. Uh, since Rupert Murdoch bought the Wall Street Journal, I've discovered that we all have a great deal of interest in Australia we never knew we had before. <laughs> It's, um, it's quite an experience to come to a country which has full employment, ours is at 10%, a country which has something that the Chinese want to buy, we don't, <laughs> and a country where I understand the central bank is concerned about the new rules for bank liquidity because there's a, not enough government bonds for the banks to hold here to satisfy the liquidity premium because your fiscal policy has been so responsible, the stock of bonds is small. Another problem we don't have in the United States. Um, I thought maybe, uh, I, I want to say how honored and humbled I am to be on the stage with Paul Keating. Uh, I'm a newspaper reporter. I haven't changed the world, uh, even my own little hometown. Uh, and Paul Keating is a man who changed Australia, and I understand is responsible for everything good I've seen here and nothing that's bad. Is that? <laughs> I've also discovered that I missed a great opportunity as a journalist because it must have been a lot of fun to be a journalist in Australia covering the Keating Prime Ministership. <laughs> so I want to talk about three things. One, is this great recession a recession we had to have? <laughs> and I, I think the answer to that is no. This is not a recession that was caused by a central bank that tightened monetary policy, raised interest rates, to slay the dragon of inflation, as Paul Volcker did in the United States in the 1980s. This is not a recession that was caused by a war in the Middle East that drove up the price of oil and led to uh, uh, widespread dislocations in every country of the world that depends on oil. This is really a recession that was created by hubris and greed and failure of imagination. 
And in two very short, I think there's two things that we were led to believe in the United States that turned out not to be true. One was, we were led to believe that in our country, house prices would never fall across the board. They might have to go down in some town and up in another town, but they never fall across the board. We built a financial house of cards on that assumption. When people got mortgages in the United States that they were really unable to afford, both they and the lender and the person who bought the loan from the lender assumed that house prices would go up. So if the person couldn't afford the mortgage, no problem, you just refinance, get more debt, and you can keep paying. Well, once the merry-go-round stopped, not only did the people who had the house lose them, one out of every four mortgage holders in the United States has a mortgage that's greater than the value of his or her house today. One out of every four. Not only did they lose, but we built a house of cards on top of that. So we managed to do this miraculous alchemy where losses on one mortgage would be magnified as the person who held the security and the person who held the security built on that and the person who built the security had the security built on that lost money. And the second thing we were told is that we had extraordinary financial innovation, much of which was indeed helpful and led us to have a more uh, a, a smoother economy. We, after all, we had a couple of decades of strong growth in the United States with low inflation and low, low employment. But it turned out this financial innovation did not spread the risk around the world as much as we thought. That an enormous amount of the risk was concentrated on the books of the big banks in the United States. And when the house of cards fell, the losses were on their books, they were unable to function, and we got a great panic. A great panic in the sense of everybody doing things that makes a situation worse. When everybody believes the world is going to be bad, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's what happened here, really. And in a sense, the rest is detail. The rest is about the financial system reacting to these two false assumptions. So the second question is, so are there any heroes in this story? And I understand that Paul Keating described somebody, I'm not sure who it was, uh, as a shiver looking for a spine to run up. Um, the, 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 internet, the internet is a wonderful thing for a visiting journalist. Well, in my telling of the story, Ben Bernanke is not that kind of guy. Ben Bernanke, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, a nice Jewish boy from a small town in South Carolina, whose dad and uncle ran a drugstore, who had very high college test scores, so high that everybody in town knew what they were, a, ki a, ki a kid who was plucked, who would have gone to the, the state university in South Carolina, North Carolina, except for an Only in America story, where an African-American guy, eight years older than him, who had been sent to Harvard by a National Presbyterian Church program, had warm feelings towards the Bernanke family because Ben Bernanke's dad and uncle extended credit to black people in that town, and not every business did. And he convinced Ben Bernanke to go to Harvard, MIT, became a, an economist who studied essentially one thing. How did the Fed screw it up so badly so we had a Great Depression in the 1930s? And he believed, as Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, the great economists, did, that the Fed had tightened the spigot of credit too tight at just the wrong moment, caused a Great Depression, and caused the banks to fail. Bernanke said they were right on the first part, but the failure of the banks was an independent cause of the Great Depression. And when the banks failed, they clogged the channels of credit and the economy couldn't function. <clears throat> that was a very interesting intellectual exercise which seemed to have absolutely no relevance to our time. He was like an economic paleontologist studying dinosaur <laughs> bones, when one day on the horizon ap appears an economic Tyrannosaurus rex and an economic br Brontosaurus, and with some hesitation uh, and with some contrition, because he was part of the problem, part of the, he made decisions that led to this crisis, he resolved to do whatever it took to prevent a repeat of the Great Depression. And so, uh, <clears throat> If, you, if, you, if things got really bad in September 2008, well, the answer is they would have been worse had he not done the things he did. Cut interest rates to zero. Expand the Fed's portfolio of loans from $800 billion on the day he took office to $2.3 trillion today. Uh, to make decisions that were quite tough, maybe some of them wrong, which institutions to save and which to fail. He filled a vacuum that exists because in our system of government, the President of the United States could respond if North Korea or Iran lobbed missiles at us. You know, Barack Obama has a code on his BlackBerry. 
L-M-N, launch missiles now. <laughs> But there's no code on his BlackBerry that says we need to create $2 trillion dollars to fight the worst threat to our financial system we've seen in my lifetime. And Ben Bernanke did that. And, and I think that is uh, uh, to his credit. And the reason he's very unpopular in the United States, the hero in my book of an unpopular in the streets, is that most people think he saved Wall Street and didn't save Main Street. Because Ben Bernanke's honest slogan, if he hung one on the wall of the Federal Reserve in Washington is, it could have been worse. It could have been worse. You don't win elections with bumper stickers that say it could have been worse. And that's really the best you could do. The third point I want to make is to ask the question, is the United States on the verge of becoming a banana republic? <laughs> uh, I don't think so, but I'm a little concerned. Because we have had a bad war, but we have fought our way out of it, and we are in a heck of a lot of better shape than the Europeans are. Not better than you, as I said, because you have something China wants to buy, and all we do is take their savings and invest it in our healthcare system. Um, <laughs> but uh, we have a fundamental problem, and it's one that Bernanke has to deal with, but he can't solve. Americans want more services from their government than they're willing to pay in taxes, and we have a political system without, that is, finds it easier to say no than to say yes, and can't find a way to resolve that. We are living in a sense of false security, because as long as the Chinese are willing to lend us unlimited amounts of money at very low interest rates, this can go on. And the day they decide they don't want to do that, it will stop. And either we will have a crisis and it will force us to live within our means, we'll have leadership that forces us to live within our means, or we will muddle through and hope that the day of the crisis never comes. I think the first and the third things are bad options. Uh, most politicians in the United States would stand on this stage and tell you the deficit and our debt is a problem, and they would tell you the problem here is my constituents wants me to solve this, but they don't want me to raise taxes or cut spending. So that's where we are now. And if things end happily, maybe we'll look like Australia in 20 years. If not, we'll go the way of the British Empire, a country that people talk about in the past tense. Thank you. Thank you for that, David. Um, I won't throw a question just yet, but I will observe that uh, you said if a crisis comes, I was wondering what you've just been through the last couple of years, if that wasn't a crisis. Mr Keating, could we uh, maybe flip the story and look at Australia? and why this thing that sucked in the rest of the world didn't hit us in the same way. That's the first part of the question. And I'll give you another thing to think about. For the last 20 or so years in public life, we assume the Americans knew what they were doing. But I think in the last couple of years, certainly this is the uh, word around uh, Canberra, that no one, people in Treasury say this, people in Reserve Bank say this in Sydney, no one for, for a minute had imagined that they didn't know what they were doing. And the last couple of years has come as a, as a real institutional shock, I think, to, the, uh, to, to, the, to uh, a lot of the main players in the world and humble players like Australia. So if I could maybe throw those two well, thoughts think, to you. I think going to, the, uh, going to the antecedents of the crisis is important. Firstly, let me say, uh, Dave has written a very important book. To have a cheek, uh, cheek by jowl blow-by-blow blow snapshot of this uh, very important period of, uh, in economic history, the history of the largest economy, of uh, the central financial system of the world, of the central bank, of the central financial system of the world, is a, is a, uh, a document of history. And uh, um, he deserves our congratulations for doing it. Thank you. Uh, I think it's worth remembering where, where, the, where did this crisis come from? Um, it really, I think, came from the Asian crisis of 1997. The moment the IMF ransacked Indonesia and destroyed Suharto, from that moment on, the Chinese, uh, all of the Asian states, certainly, the surplus ones, decided they would go for exports currency interventions uh, and the development of interne large international reserves. In other words, 
Uh, you see, the, the reserves of the IMF today, before the, the new replenishment, is about 200 billion. The reserves of China are 2,200 million. So the Chinese decided they would never go cap in hand to a Washington-based institution like the IMF to be done in in the same way Suharto was done in. Uh, so they decided they'd have their own IMF. They'd have their own reserves. And so between uh, uh, the 90s, over the 90s up to 2008, we had about five and a half trillion of official currency reserves floating in the world. That's on top of the normal surpluses, trading surpluses of countries like Germany and Japan. So you've got a lot of money out there. Essentially, if we look at it this way, you had this cloud of money. It's like if we have it make a, the simile with a storm, you have this cloud. What this, what this did was essentially um, uh, crowd in spending in the countries with elastic credit systems like the United States, like Britain, like Australia, like that. So you know this old phrase, crowding out. Crowding out is a phrase, uh, an economic phrase, where if governments borrow, it makes it harder for businesses to borrow, uh, more expensive, so business gets crowded out by the government big program. This is the obverse of this. This is crowding in. You have all these savings which in the end have to be borrowed. So I, I think what happened was this. We have this great cloud. The cloud has water and electricity. It's floating around the world. What happened is, I think, under Alan Greenspan's Federal Reserve, over a decade, Alan built a great copper conductor into the cloud <laughs> and a great pipe, a great pipe into the cloud. And he visited essentially 70% of the savings onto the US financial system. Alan was a serial bubble blower. He had, he had these bubbles. He had the bubble, he had the Asian financial crisis bubble. Uh, low interest rates, monetary accommodations, the Asian financial crisis, the dot-com crisis of 2000, the Russian debt crisis, September 11, 2001, SARS, Enron, uh, WorldCom, they went on and on. He kept monetary conditions accommodating. What had happened, this visited the cloud onto the US financial system. And so the great strike, I think, against the American Federal Reserve System is that it rationalised a, a huge and glaring international anomaly. You've got this massive anomaly of all these savings which should be spent on the poor countries. These vast savings should be spent on poor people. Instead of that, these vast savings were visited onto the richest people. The richest people in the US, Britain, Australia, etc. The deficit countries visited the savings on themselves. This is a reversal of history. In history, savings you know, you talk about foreign direct investment going to developing countries. This is foreign direct investment into the richest country. So what the Fed did, I think, under Greenspan was provide an incredible rationalisation to, to, in other words, he resolved the imbalance in current account deficits and savings in the most unlikely way. He visited the savings on the richest people and the consumer societies of the United States. And that led to, as David said, and how did this happen? Fundamentally, it was directed to the piggy bank of American housing. People had their houses and they had equity in them, which, were, which was the, the gap over their, their value, less their debt, so they had equity. They had to liberate that equity and they did it through securitised mortgages. They remortgaged their houses at lower interest rates, took the difference, spent it, uh, and then the mortgages were spread around. And the end result is, as David said, there was a belief that American housing would not fall across a whole society in value. It actually did. But, but before it did, essentially, the Federal Reserve system under mainly Alan Greenspan, more latterly under Bernanke, uh, Allowed the, uh, allowed the households of America to actually indebt themselves in a way which you would have thought the manager of the monetary system wouldn't have done. Then enter the scene comes, we have the crisis, we have the fall, we have 
Bear Stearns, we have Lehman Brothers, we have what have you. Uh, David's characterization of Bernanke is, I think, correct. We have a person who says, as David reports him, I want a, a paradigm change here. Uh, we're not going to see a second depression. And he eventually, essentially invents a new branch of government. He turns the Federal Reserve in Ameri of America into, in, he, he changes it from running a monetary policy to running a fiscal policy. What he does, he starts not simply buying American Treasury securities, but he starts buying the securities, risky securities from the banking system and, uh, and even corporate securities. So as David said a moment ago, he goes from 800, uh, 800 uh, uh, million uh, of, uh, uh, 800 billion, sorry, of, uh, of, uh, of assets to two and a half trillion of assets. Uh, essentially what he did, he stepped in when the congressional leadership was not able to either make up its mind or act decisively. Uh, he stepped in and really of its essence, save the day. Uh, the book is about him saving the day. Not really all about them saving the day, but in fact he did save the day. Um, and uh, he did step in. And, uh, you know, it just turns out uh, that, that little bit of history David told us about his early life and uh, about his focus on the Depression, uh, it's very important for all the rest of us that we had a paleontologist there. <laughs> Yeah, at the scene when the Sanosaurus Rex got out of the cage, yeah. and uh, and the, the and and we got saved. I mean, things are still tough. I've got these big fiscal overhangs, but essentially Bernanke did what Greenspan would not have done. Okay, David, maybe um, maybe we can start the conversation now. I, I, I one question I have is so if I had been sitting here two months ago, I would have been saying things are getting slowly better. Uh, I'm, but I'm a little concerned about what's gone on in Europe. I'm concerned that they haven't been able to react swiftly and creatively. And I'm curious what your analysis is of what's going on in Europe and how much of what happens in Europe stays in Europe and how much comes to Sydney and Washington. Yeah. Well, I'm a little more optimistic than most people. I mean, the euro, the euro could have been a Deutschmark replacement if it had just have had Germany, France, and the Benelux countries, you know. But once they invited in Spain, Portugal, Greece, uh, Ireland, etc., the euro became a composite currency. It's a different thing altogether to the Deutschmark. But it carried with it the benefit of Deutschmark interest rates. So all of a sudden these countries like Spain and Portugal and Greece who used to have these elevated interest rates holding down spending and consumption, uh, the moment they got led into the euro there was a sort of once in history party where, where they started spending because the interest rates were so low and because these in Spain and in uh, Portugal and other parts, there was unrequited demand, so a lot of money went out, investment monies into these countries. We had a massive housing bubble in Spain, uh, in Portugal, in Ireland. Um, and I think what's happened is we've now got the fiscal accounting of that bubble, of those bubbles. And that, so what is the problem? Is it a lack of fiscal convergence first? and bubble second, or is it bubbles first and fiscal policy? I think it's the latter. That is, private financial irresponsibility has produced this crisis, as it did in the United States, and budgets are there. They're now picking up the mess. Of course, the budgets now, re revenues dropped off, unemployment benefits have gone up, bailouts have cost, so their budgets have deteriorated massively. The question is, how do they, how do they get out of it? This is the issue. In the old days, they could have a competitive depreciation. You know, the drac market go down and uh, the, all these currencies, the Irish pound could depreciate. In, in, in a currency union, you can't do that. So there's got to be, the, the, there's got to be a, a lift in competitiveness inside these countries. And that means, I think, lower prices for their products. That means lower costs. That means lower wages. 
Um, and, and, and the issue is will, and, and of course they have no fiscal action, they've got, they've got a fiscal tightening on as a consequence, so fiscal policy can't help, there can't be any government stimulus spending. So the question is there's going to be a long haul out to see whether Spain, Portugal, Greece, etc., can end up looking like France and Germany. And if they don't look like France and Germany, after a period of time, they have to leave the Union. So I think that's where it's going to go. Right. And I think that the, the frightening thing is that while this is going on, <clears throat> while they're having a meeting to decide whether to send the fire engines to Greece, um, uh, there are a lot of people who, uh, in the world markets who now know what the worst case scenario looks like. It looks like the fall of 2008. And so it took the world markets from about June or July 2007 to get to where they were in September 2008, where everybody was terrified, nobody was willing, the banks weren't willing to lend to each other. The risk is, with that memory still fresh, are we rushing to something that looks uncomfortably close to that? And I, I don't think so, but I'm not so confident as I might have been because I saw it happen then. Yeah. And so it, this contagion of anxiety and angst in financial markets could disrupt our, um, our recovery at just the time when we really are getting things going. And, you know, it's, I see it's hit the Aussie dollar by 3% in the last few days. And yeah. so yeah. It's, uh, the, the world is an awfully frightening place because of what we just went through. Yeah. But David, can I just ask this question? What, what became so fundamentally unhitched that in the first instance you had financial institutions running at each other? This was a top end of town run. This wasn't right. traditionally the way you'd, you'd, you'd associate a recession or a depression. It started at the top. And, and for many people, certainly in this room, it didn't feel like anything other than something they read in their papers or saw on their um, superannuation funds. Right. So in a sense, there's a lack of reality in the first transaction, which is the financial institutions blowing each other up. Phase two, if it is going to be another, if there is another run, this is a run at countries. Correct. Now, we haven't had a run at countries quite on this magnitude. Now, most of the, uh, most of the Western economies are carrying uh, debts that you only ever run up in the past in wartime. So you're looking at reconstructions here, but without the, the sort of glue to bind a society to get, to get on with the recovery. So these are, um, these are concepts for me that I'm still trying to work out I think, in, in I think my those, work. I think those are both uh, very trenchant observations. On the first, uh, look, we ha I, I agree with what Mr. Keating said in part about Alan Greenspan and uh, the uh, collecting all the Chinese savings and investing them into our subprime mortgage market. Um, but I think that the problem was that this was a reality. The Chinese had a lot of savings. And we were going through a period of time where we, Greenspan in particular, believes that financial markets are best left to themselves. Mm -hmm. And so we had an evolution of our financial systems that went way beyond the capacity of the regulatory system to even understand what was going on. So just one small example, you know, we have a lot of banks. The banks are highly supervised. Uh, a lot of the lousy mortgages that created this problem were made outside the banking system in uh, mortgage companies that weren't very well regulated, in Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, which weren't very well regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And so we had a bubble in finance, and the institutions that got us into trouble, some of them were big banks, of course, and they were supervised, so you can't give these guys a, a complete uh, pass, but a lot of it happened because our financial system had evolved way, way beyond the capacity of any regulator to understand it. Um, it is true that this, there was a run on the big banks, uh, but it was really a system-wide run. It wasn't like there were a whole bunch of healthy banks out there. And uh, it, it, uh, it's not actually unprecedented in history. In 1907, we had a run on the banking system in the United States. We had no central bank. Uh, J.P. Morgan, the man, bailed out the, the system. And after that, they created the Federal Reserve in 1913, basically to deal with panics. But that kind of uh, responsibility uh, faded away because it didn't seem like anything we had anymore. I, th uh, I think that the, your second point is a good one. Uh, a lot of governments around the world have a lot of debt. And uh, the first phase of the crisis, the governments bail out the banks. The second phase of the crisis, the, the governments get into trouble. 
There's only so many supranational organizations, the European Central Bank, the International Monetary Fund, to bail out governments. And, uh, but at some point, uh, people don't have much choice. People, unless everybody wants to buy gold and hold on to gold, or I guess the Chinese, if it's all they want to buy iron ore and coal and hold on to that, uh, you end up, you know, it's hard to, if you can't buy U.S. Treasury securities, if you can't consider them safe, then kind of the game is over. So at this point, people still have c confidence that in a panic, holding U.S. Treasury securities are the safest thing you can do with your money. But as we become the world's largest subprime borrower without a credible business plan, people will begin to doubt that and our interest rates will rise. And the question really is, will, will the lessons of Greece be learned by the lessons of countries bigger and more powerful than Greece? Will we, over the next couple of years, come to terms with this thing or not? And I don't know the answer, but I know that's the right question.